can stay on time from now on. Uh, good evening and welcome everybody. My name is Maria Glidden. I'm the development coordinator at Crohn's and Colitis Canada for Southwestern Ontario. On behalf of Crohn's and Colitis Canada and McMaster University, we want to welcome everybody tonight to our Gutsy Learning series. All of you here in the room and those of you participating from home tonight. The Gutsy Learning Series is a novel education initiative spearheaded by McMaster University in collaboration with Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Now in its second year, this biannual series made possible through generous funding from Janssen aims to provide patients with the opportunity to learn more about the latest in Crohn's and colitis, including measuring treatment success, mental health, and patient journeys. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, our event this evening is being broadcast live over the internet, so that allows participants from across the country to join in tonight as well. And I understand that as of a few hours ago, there were close to 500 people who had registered to join us tonight. So we're in good company and we welcome all of them from across the country. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everybody's aware of the cell phone policy, so make sure you're on vibrator silent. Uh, washrooms, for those of you who are here in the room tonight, are directly outside the doors. Uh, across the hallway here and for those of you at home please take note that we will be taking a 10 minute break we're going to try to be exactly 10 minutes from 7:20 till 7:30 so make sure you come back to your computers at 7:30 when our presentations will resume we are going to have a question and answer period at the end of this session we're going to try and get as many of your answers question uh, questions answered as possible. And there's a couple of ways that you can get your questions to us. One is by typing them directly in your chat box, and another is by emailing them to learn at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. And of course, those of you here with us tonight will be able to come up to the mic and ask your question uh, in person. Again, thank you all for attending, both face-to-face -face and online. We hope you're going to find tonight's presentation uh, informative and that you're going to leave here knowing a little bit more about Crohn's and colitis and some of the impacts that people face when they're living with either Crohn's or colitis. So let's get right on with our presentations. We've got three great speakers tonight. Our first one is uh, Dr. Marshall, uh, who's going to be talking to us about the measuring success in IBD, treatment effects and moving towards patient report outcomes. Dr. Marshall is a professor of medicine at McMaster University and an active consultant gastroenterologist at Hamilton Health Sciences. After completing his BA and MD at Queen's University, he undertook his residency training and master's in science in clinical epidemiology and biostatics at McMaster University. He is now the director of the training program in adult gastroenterology and head of the clinical research for the Division of Gastroenterology at the Farncombe Family Digestive Health Research Institute. Dr. Marshall earned a Clinician Scientist Award from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and has received peer-reviewed research funding from several agencies, including Crohn's and Colitis Canada. He also serves on our Crohn's and Colitis Canada's Scientific and Medical Advisory Council quite a handful. So help me welcome Dr. John Marshall. Well, thanks uh, very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to have, a, this is our second in a series of Gutsy Learning uh, series events. We hope this will be an ongoing uh, uh, series of events. And what we're trying to do is cover slightly different topics with each of our evening sessions. So uh, those, some of you may have been here when we ran our first session in the fall. Uh, we have a slightly different uh, set of topics uh, tonight. And we'll be looking for suggestions for topics for future events. And any of you in the room and those of you online who have uh, topics you'd like to see presented, we're certainly receptive to your uh, suggestions. Uh, now, last time we, I talked a little bit about uh, medical therapy for inflammatory bowel disease, and so we're going to choose something a little different uh, tonight, and uh, we're going to be talking about measuring outcomes and measuring success in inflammatory bowel disease. It's, a, it's a, an important topic uh, for those of us involved in doing research in Crohn's and colitis, and hopefully it'll be relevant to all of you uh, in the room as well. Um, 
So we're talking about defining IBD outcomes. And at the end of the day, uh, all of you uh, as patients, family members, and all of us as healthcare providers too, I think have the same goal that we want everybody to get better and stay better. That's really what we're aiming towards. But I think there is often a bit of a divide between uh, those of uh, you who are suffering with Crohn's and colitis and what you think of as success and perhaps what healthcare community thinks of as success. And I'm hoping that over the course of this, there's some positive news that we may be moving in the, same, in the right direction so that uh, what we look for in research is what you uh, are seeking in, as an outcome of your care. So, you know, patients uh, think about things, I just want to get back to work, I want to live my life, I want to resume sports activities, I want to be able to go out for dinner and enjoy a nice dinner out, I want to resume intimacy, I want to sleep well. And those are often kind of the top things in the minds of, of patients suffering. Whereas I think healthcare providers maybe look at some sort of cold heart statistics. Is there bleeding, is there not? Are the blood tests uh, becoming normal? Uh, does your endoscopy start to look better? And maybe for some people, have you stopped calling your uh, physician or your nurse practitioner? So uh, no news is good news. I don't know if that looks like me in the lower right, but perhaps that is me. So we want to try to make sure that our goals reflect your goals and, and vice versa. So you know, maybe we talk a little bit about what the goals are of, uh, from our side as physicians, as nurses, and as people doing uh, research and clinical trials. I'll just show you. Um, a typical outcome report from a clinical trial studying a medication for, in this case, Crohn's disease, in this case, this infliximab, which is Remicade, but I can show you very similar graphs for every treatment that we have. So we kind of think about, you know, uh, different treatments, the placebo, so there's a red bar represents patients who are given uh, the sham, a, a fake medication, and then the other three bars are patients who receive various doses of an active medication, which in this case was Remicade. And then what we measure and, and going up the access is, you know, what proportion of patients went into remission uh, with that treatment. And you can see that there was a dose of the medication, five milligrams per kilogram, that had the highest rate of success in getting people into remission. And that turns out to be the dose that we use routinely with uh, Remicade now, and it's based on these kinds of observations. So we're looking at clinical remission at, after two weeks of treatment. And that phrase doesn't often resonate very well with patients, but that's what we look like, look for in research. And you can see then that means a CDAI less than 150. So I'll just take you through what some of these acronyms mean, because if you're becoming a more informed patient, a more informed consumer, you're gonna be reading through a lot of stuff that kind of has a little bit of scientific input as well. And I think you wanna be a little uh, savvy as to what some of the scientific jargon is referring to. So what do we mean by saying that a CDAI is less than 150 being uh, a good outcome uh, for a medication. Well, this CDAI is a Crohn's disease activity index. So this is something that's been around for, if you look at the date in the bottom, it's actually 40 years now uh, that, uh, since this instrument was introduced. And it's a way of measuring whether someone's Crohn's disease is active or not and try to get a, a number as to how active that Crohn's disease is. But man, is it complicated. So you can go down that what's in the yellow table, you gotta have a seven day diary reporting your bowel habit. Uh, you gotta have a healthcare provider assessing you in terms of how well they think you are. You gotta look at what medications you're using for diarrhea. Someone's gotta examine your tummy. You gotta have a blood test to measure the blood counts. Uh, and you gotta be weighed. And then you've got this list of other things that can happen at the bottom, like joint problems, eye problems, skin problems all the things that can happen to people with Crohn's and colitis. And then you gotta multiply all those things by different weights and you come up with a number at the end of the day. That number is less than 150, that means you're in remission. 150 to 200, 220 means that you're mild, 220 to 450 means that you're moderate, and if it's over 450, it's severe. And it's a very messy system, really very controversial, but for most of the, the last few decades, this has been really the best that we've had for measuring outcomes. I tell you, one of the challenges with Crohn's disease is that every patient's experience with Crohn's disease is very different. It really isn't a cookie cutter version of what Crohn's disease is and what it means and uh, what people experience. So it's very hard to take a thousand people with Crohn's disease and then come up with one way of measuring whether that Crohn's disease is active or not. So there's a real problem to start out with. And this has been, uh, uh, for a long time, the best effort to try to measure whether people with Crohn's disease are well or not.
So that CDAI, which you'll often hear discussed, is this Crohn's disease activity index. Now, none of us use this in practice. If you come to see someone in a clinic, no one, I, well, maybe someone is, but very few people are scribbling down and trying to do all this calculation in front of you to figure out what your number is in the clinic. This is really used in research when you're trying to measure whether a drug works or whether another intervention works. So there are other things. This is another one you might see mentioned, the Harvey Bradshaw Index. It's simpler, you know, if you go through this, is how well you feel in general, how much pain you're having, how often you go into the bathroom, whether or not when someone examines your tummy, whether there's a mass or a fullness there, and then that little list of complications at the bottom that can happen to some people. It's a much simpler scoring system, but still not something that's easy to use in practice, and it's not something that uh, patients can measure for themselves uh, very easily. Right? But we, we do use this in some research studies as well to measure whether a treatment's working or not and whether someone's disease is controlled or not. So I think, I think it's worth just knowing these titles, and these acronyms, so the CDAI and the uh, Harvey Bradshaw Index. So for ulcerative colitis, those two scores are really for measuring uh, success in people with Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis is a little different, and I would say ulcerative colitis is slightly more straightforward condition because it's a bit more homogeneous. You know, people with ulcerative colitis uh, experience things a lot more similarly than do people with Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis, as you know, always inflames the rectum, and its inflammation is, for the most part, limited to the large bowel. It's sometimes it's only the rectum, sometimes it goes up the left side of the bowel, and sometimes it goes all the way around the whole bowel. But at the end of the day, the rectum's inflamed, and a lot of what people experience reflects the, the, a, 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 an irritated uh, rectum. So the scoring system is a bit easier, but this Mayo score measures things like how often you go to the bathroom, how much blood you're passing, what your endoscopy looks like, and then what the physician's global assessment is, the physician kind of looking at you and saying, oh, I think you're mild, moderate, or severe. But at the end of the day, it's a much simpler uh, system, and if you, you, if all those things can score from zero to three, so if you add them up, you can get a score anywhere from zero to 12, so you get a number that measures how active ulcerative colitis is. And this, because it's a bit more simpler, sometimes does get used in the clinic. When, if you have ulcerative colitis, you go see your gastroenterologist, he or she may actually uh, be either in front of you or afterwards calculating your Mayo score, zero to 12, so that they can record that in the chart. And then every time you come back, get a better idea as to whether things are going up or down, getting better or worse. A lot of insurance companies actually want us to provide Mayo scores and we apply to get the approval to pay for medications uh, to explain whether that, that medication is justified. So this is, this is out there, it's used, and I, I think, again, it's worth uh, knowing. And I would say that one advantage of using systems like this in the clinic to measure how active your disease is, is that, you know, when I see someone in Hamilton, someone else sees you in Toronto, someone, you move to Timmins and someone else sees you there, if we're all kind of describing things the same way as healthcare providers, that means that the care you get is one step closer to being similar in every city that you go to if your care is, has to move between centers. So there's a lot of advantage to using real organized systems for reading this. So, We'll mention, uh, this is bragging now, that a bunch of us in Canada uh, put together what we call our guidelines, which are a set of recommendations for how ulcerative colitis should be managed uh, uh, in patients who are not in hospital, but in outpatient clinics. So this was the Toronto Consensus Conference. And it kind of put Canada on the map. In fact, it put a map of Canada on the front page of the major academic journal for uh, gastroenterology in the world, which is called gastroenterology. It's an American journal, and they had a map of Canada on the front, so we're very proud of that. We're particularly impressed that the American editors chose to color the province of Alberta orange, and this was before the recent election, so they knew something was, uh, was coming, perhaps. But this has actually attracted a lot of attention around the world about how we manage ulcerative colitis. I'm not going to go through that, but I will say that we in the, uh, that guideline statement have actually declared what we think the goal of care in treating patients with ulcerative colitis is, and it's something we call a complete remission, which is not just that symptoms go away, but that the underlying inflammation of ulcerative colitis is under control. So that, for example, could mean that uh, if we have another colonoscopy, that the colonoscopy looks better, if not normal, and that, the, that your symptoms have gone. So what, We've, that's kind of raising the bar. So I will say for the most part of the last few decades, 
the goal has been to get rid of symptoms. And we all want people to feel better, don't, but we know that the symptoms aren't the only story. And if we don't control the underlying disease, those the, the, you can suffer a flare again in the future. Symptoms may not remain controlled over the long term. And you may face higher rates of surgery uh, even though you're feeling better. So we want you to feel better, but then we want to go one step further, actually make sure that we control the underlying disease. It kind of makes a lot of intuitive sense, but it's only in the last, uh, say, decade that we've had the studies that really prove that it's important to do that. So we, the goal of treating ulcerative colitis is a durable, steroid-free, complete remission. That is, we get you feeling better, we heal you up uh, inside. This is done without requiring long-term steroids and it is for the long term, it's a durable condition. So um, when we talk about complete remission, we talk about this phrase of mucosal healing. That's another endpoint in treating patients with Crohn's and colitis, and it's become a buzzword, at least in medical circles over the last decade. And what does that mean? Well, mucosal healing really means that you turn uh, ulcerative colitis, which looks like this typically at, at colonoscopy, and Crohn's disease, which typically looks like this, at uh, colonoscopy into a nice normal looking colon. That's really what the idea of mucosal healing. Mucosa is a word for the inner lining of the bowel. It's a medical word for that. So if you heal the mucosa, we're healing the lining of the bowel and controlling the actual disease of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So we think that if we treat people to the point not just of feeling better, but of having this healing inside, that they're more likely to stay in remission for a long term and they're less likely to have surgery, less likely to end up in hospital, and probably less likely to develop colon cancer, which, as you know, can happen more commonly in people with Crohn's and colitis. So we do think this is an important goal of care. And again, this is another buzzword. If you're kind of perusing through this literature and looking at things online, you'll see that phrase mentioned, mucosal healing. I think it's important that you, you know what that means. So, because mucosal healing, really, if we think that ulcerative colitis in particular is an inflammation of the lining of the bowel. If we control that, we've actually controlled the disease itself at its root. Uh, we think that that's a much better predictor of long-term success than just getting rid of symptoms. We do like to get rid of symptoms. I don't want to give the wrong message. Because we do think that mucosal healing, control of the disease, has a lower risk of relapse of symptoms down the road, lower risk of surgery, lower risk of being in hospital, lower risk of cancer a lower risk of disability, so more ability, but less disability. We'll come back to that concept at the end and realize there's a typo there. But also, we can save the system money. You know, If we're actually keeping people in a hospital, the healthcare system isn't spending as much looking after people. And that may justify some of the expense of some of the therapies for Crohn's and colitis if we know that we're actually saving money down the road by uh, using less uh, surgeons and less hospitals. But there's a dilemma here, right? We think that treating to this target, which is controlling the disease, controlling the inflammation, we think it's a good thing. Mucosal healing is a good thing right? for all the reasons I've just explained. The problem is that the tool to measure that, which is usually colonoscopy, isn't necessarily people's favorite uh, experience. Um, people don't like having colonoscopies. There are some that do, I can tell you that, but most people don't. Uh, and uh, it, colonoscopies are expensive. We've got long waiting lists, and it's a precious resource. So it's an, one great way of measuring success and failure with treating Crohn's and colitis, but it does have some limitations. So we've got to be careful how and when we use it. So I, I will just mention that another uh, test that um, is getting a lot of attention is this test called fecal calprotectin. Uh, calprotectin is a chemical that is in the stool. It's fecal calprotectin. So this is analyzing a stool sample for the level of calprotectin. Calprotectin is something that's in white blood cells. So when white blood cells come to the bowel, inflame the lining of the bowel, and they eventually die, they've done their job, they, they break down, they release their contents, which include calprotectin. So the more calprotectin you have in the stool, the more white blood cells there are attacking the lining of the bowel so that we can use the level of calprotectin to estimate how inflamed the bowel is. So if the calprotectin level is low or normal, that means that it's probably not inflamed. If it's high, it probably means uh, it's inflamed and maybe the disease isn't well controlled. So it's another way as an alternative to colonoscopy to try to measure activity of disease. And this is just a graph from one of many studies showing that as, col as colitis gets worse, these little pictures at the bottom are the levels of colitis in that Mayo score. 
the level of calprotectin gets higher. There are lots of studies which have shown the same thing. So calprotectin, uh, we're lucky in Hamilton because our hospital offers the calprotectin testing for free for any patients who are patients of the hospital. I think it's the only place in Canada where the hospital has agreed to do this. We're very grateful for this. So we use a lot of this in clinic, more so perhaps than people are able to at other centers. But there are some other ways to access calprotectin testing through some special pharmacies and also uh, through some of the private labs. And, and some of the private labs certainly do it for money. Uh, it, it's available. But we think this is going to prove to be a very useful uh, tool. It's nice because you can collect the sample. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. It can be stored at room temperature for a few days. It can be mailed uh, through Canada Post legally. And uh, so it's very easy to get samples shipped around. I will point out that there are various uh, um, ways of collecting stool samples in a friendly way. This is a product out there just from the website that uh, there's a whole kit on how to collect a stool sample. No one likes doing this, so this is a relatively clean way of doing this. And I have no idea why the husband and wife here are arm in arm talking about the easy sampler technology, but I thought I'd show you that from the website. So it's a way you can sample, take stool samples at home, ship them, and uh, have them analyzed. And we, there's a lot of potential for fecal count protectant. In Europe, people are looking at uh, doing the assay at home. So there's a little kit where you can actually run the test at home. And it, there's a color readout on the kit. You can take a picture of that color readout with an iPhone or another smartphone and transmit the picture. Then you get the result back. So you can do it at home and get the results back to you. So this, this may come to Canada at some point where you can actually monitor your disease activity at home directly and, and take more uh, responsibility for your own care, become more engaged in your care. So we'll see if that actually goes anywhere. And so we talked about goals of care in inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, I'll divulge my age by saying I graduated from high school in 1985. That was the era of Duran Duran, Rubik's Cubes, and big hair, all that. And we're really all about the symptoms. If you felt good, we're happy with that. And that was really true of managing Crohn's and colitis in 1985. But over time, other goals of care have become important. So we talk about uh, limiting how much steroid people require for controlling their disease. We've talked about trying to avoid surgery versus using surgery at an early stage. We've talked about healing the mucosa already. And ultimately, what that's all aimed towards is limiting disability and giving patients with Crohn's and colitis as close to a normal quality and quantity of life uh, as possible. And we hope that most patients with Crohn's and colitis can experience normal uh, life in 2015. So, Another thing that came out of our guideline statement is how we assess patients. And I think we've tried to guide our colleagues to becoming more comprehensive about considering lots of things and making decisions about patients. So in the yellow there is disease activity. So are you mild, moderate, to severe? What does your CDAI say? What does your Mayo score say? That's how active your disease is. But we really know, and we want to declare this in these guidelines, that you know, we have to assess more than that. We have to look at how the disease is impacting people because you can have two people with the same number for scoring their disease who are affected very differently by their disease. Some people will be unable to work, unable to function socially in all kinds of ways, whereas other people seem to cope better with their disease. People who are disabled really want to get them better faster. It's people who are uh, managing, maybe we can try a few things before we go up to uh, stronger treatments. And so we have to consider impact. And we also have to consider what we call risk profiles. Not everybody with the same amount of disease activity is at the same risk of long-term problems like uh, uh, surgery. So there are some things we use to kind of say, well, people who develop their disease at a younger age may have higher risks over their life of uh, needing surgery and some other things that we look at. So not just looking, the idea is not just looking narrowly at what your disease activity score is. We try to be more holistic in patient assessment. So there have been um, some, uh, I think, very good efforts to try to understand what patients with Crohn's and colitis experience and how they're impacted. And these are, this is a Canadian study, Crohn's and colitis Canada supported. Uh, it was published in our journal, which is the Canadian Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, just in the last uh, few months. And this was an online survey. Some of you may have participated in this. It was advertised through the CCC website and through Alberta uh, IBD clinics. And they have about uh, 300 responses, mostly from patients, but also from some family members. And since we're talking about impact of disease and what we hope to improve in patients' lives, I'll just show you uh, that uh, patients are significantly impacted in, in several domains. They include ability to participate in leisure activities. 
the ability to uh, sustain interpersonal relationships, and it's an impact also on what patients perceive as mental health, mental wellness. We're going to hear more about that uh, this evening. So certainly from these participants in the survey, all of these things were affected. And in managing Crohn's and colitis, we can't, shouldn't just be aiming to get the bowel symptoms better. We have to look at the whole patient and try to get that whole patient better. And that's, I think, a message that we all need to, uh, to listen to in our practices. There are some open-ended responses, so patients who did the survey could write extra comments at the end. And really some of the themes that came out of that was that IBD is an all-encompassing uh, problem. It's not just the physical problems, there are social implications when people have chronic bowel disorders that I don't think are, there's not necessarily the sympathy that you'd like to see in the broader society. There certainly can be financial impacts from people limited in their ability to uh, finish education and to engage fully in the workforce, and as well as other impacts. A lot of patients emphasize the psychological impact of living with IBD, physical impact, and some of the challenges with the lack of public understanding and sympathy towards the disease. And I think organizations like Crohn's and Colitis Canada really do a lot of good that way in, in promoting what the uh, concerns are among patients and, and family members. So again, I just quickly, because I know we have to get on to some other speakers tonight, but uh, another study, this is actually from Norway, itemizing what the w dominant worries and concerns are among patients with IBD. And you can see, going through this list, it's not all about diarrhea and rectal bleeding. It's the financial challenge, which is interesting, is top of the list in, in Norway, the wealthiest country in the world. Patients with IBD see financial challenges as their biggest uh, problem. And you go through its uh, ability to achieve full potential. So I assume that means ability to uh, reach the level of education that you want and what you want to do in the workforce in your personal life as well. And all these concerns, I think, are prob probably resonate with uh, some of you in the room and, and listening online. It's a Canadian uh, review from Jen Irvin, who's a colleague uh, at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. These are most prevalent fears among patients with IBD. Will I have a normal life expectancy? Can I, will I be able to have a family, keep a job, and do the normal things that people do? Big question is always, will my children get IBD? Will I ever need surgery? Will I get cancer? How will I know if I'm going to have a flare? Well, God, well, there's no good way to predict that, but, you know, from what I said, if we control the disease better, we can reduce that risk. What are the side effects of medication? What are the best treatments out there, and will I be able to afford them? Because uh, you know, a challenge in our system is that all our new promising medications typically come with a higher price tag related to the cost of developing new medications in 2015 and beyond. So these are common fears among patients with IBD. So we all see these pictures and ads. This is where you want to be. You want to be running through fields with a normal quality of life. But what does quality of life mean? Because that's actually a medically uh, defined uh, term. So quality of life is lots of things. Uh, quality of life is, is a sort of a World Health Organization concept. If higher quality of life it reflects lots of things, uh, psychology, stress, family uh, support, education, spiritual support, but we're talking really about the top left, which is the health and safety component of quality of life. And so there is this concept of health-related quality of life. I mention that because that's another thing that gets measured in studies of new therapies for Crohn's and colitis. We actually measure health-related quality of life. And really what that is is the end result, what's the effect of a medical condition and its treatment on a patient's ability to function? It's by definition a subjective thing. It measures lots of different dimensions of what function is, things like physical function, mental, emotional, and social function. And at the end of the day, often these are survey instruments coming up with a number that measures what your quality of life is related to healthcare. And there are some generic things that measure quality of life people with all kinds of different conditions, but they're also very disease-specific things that capture some of the nuances, some of the specific problems that arise from conditions like IBD. Uh, again, not to go through this in detail, but there is a, such an instrument for Crohn's and colitis called the IBDQ. This is actually a McMaster product uh, that was generated from colleagues here. I had nothing to do with it, but it was generated from colleagues here at McMaster. And this is measured in clinical trials. It's a survey that comes up with a score go anywhere from 23 to 224. And most clinical trials in, in IBD now use this as another measure of success. So we look to see whether those 
disease activity scores get better, but also whether quality of life gets better, because we think that this is one step closer to measuring what's important to patients. And this is just an example from Sweden, some more Scandinavian data showing that, you know, normal people and all these different measures are in black, and patients with Crohn's and colitis are generally lower in their quality of life, and I won't go through the details of that. So we've learned that we should listen to patients. And it's a, not a novel concept, but something that I think healthcare systems need to be reminded of uh, frequently, because we can get very wrapped up in what we think is important, but we do have to listen to patients. And I'll just point out uh, in the last few slides that there is movement afoot to uh, listen to patients more systematically. And the Food and Drug Administration states the FDA, which is the uh, obviously body that approves drugs for sale in the United States, but also uh, puts, makes, has a lot of input into how these new medications are studied and how you measure success in clinical trials of new therapy. And they're actually officially moving away from some of these complicated things like that CDAI that I showed you at the beginning. And that's where this idea of patient-reported outcomes comes in, PROs. That's something that's all through our literature right now. And so what we think the FDA is going to move towards is measuring what we call patient-reported outcomes, as well as something that actually measures whether the disease is controlled or not, one of those objective measures like endoscopy, maybe something like fecal calprotectin. So two things patient-reported outcomes, an objective measure of inflammation. And patient-reported outcomes are really where you get the information about whether something's working or not directly from the patient. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and there are all sorts of different surveys, and I won't go through the details of these instruments listed at the bottom, ways you can just ask patients, are you feeling better or not? More than that, just going through a series of questions that don't rely on lab tests and physical examinations Take, the, take those answers directly from patients. So I think this is part validation of the fact that we've gone a little, drifted a little bit away from what's important to some of our patients. And I think that the regulatory authorities are coming back to uh, uh, what I hope you consider an important measure of success or failure. Lastly, uh, there is a, a large group uh, around the world trying to uh, develop a way of measuring disability for pe of people with Crohn's and colitis in a more organized and systematic way. And so there is this disability index for inflammatory bowel disease, which uh, uh, people listed at the bottom have contributed to, some very uh, prominent names from experts in IBD around the world. And so this is uh, being studied to see whether it measures what we think it measures. So we'll have a way in clinic to actually measure your level of disability, give a number. And that sounds kind of dry, but it could become very useful in capturing how Crohn's truly impacts on people's lives, perhaps for arguing for better, more sympathy among uh, insurance companies, among uh, drug uh, uh, reimbursement programs, uh, among government agencies for measuring that, look, people are really affected by this. And, um, uh, and so I think it's, it will do a lot for um, promoting uh, the experiences of patients with Crohn's and colitis so we can get more resources. That just shows you what's in that survey, and I don't propose to go through all of that. So I think just to summarize, I would come back to, to say that the treatment for, of inflammatory bowel disease has improved substantially over the last 20 years, and what I've seen since, well, actually 30 since 1985, but you know, since I sort of entered the medical profession, I've seen a huge change in what people can expect with Crohn's and colitis, and that's very encouraging. And so I think we every reason to, to aim higher uh, for success in patients with Crohn's and colitis, which is really trying to aim for normal quality and quantity of life and using all our therapies more intelligently to get there. So in the short term, we do measure uh, short-term symptoms. We do look at the, what the scope shows. We look at what these lab tests show. But those are really short-term goals on a journey to something longer, which is this long-term success of living a normal, healthy life and having all those normal life experiences that people have, you know, raising families, forming relationships, uh, going to school, uh, starting careers, and really we want people to have those normal experiences. So I think regulatory authorities are coming a little for, full circle in measuring patient reported outcomes, which is a positive step. There are a lot of new tools that we can use to actually measure it and come up with numbers to say, you know, whether this, these agents are working or not and whether your disease is active or not. And so I think at the end of the day, there's some hope that the goals of patients and providers are going to align better. And that wall I showed you, that brick wall I showed you at the beginning, uh, we can uh, uh, break it down a little bit. So 
I'll stop there and show you a nice picture of Hamilton. <laughs> and uh, I guess uh, next speaker or, uh, and questions at the end. So great, thanks very much.